Our second reading comes from the letter to the Galatians, chapter 3. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offsprings, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, in a land that's not so much different than ours, there were some weary travelers who came to a village with nothing but a cooking pot. The townspeople, leery of strangers, saw them coming along the road and decided that it would be better if they locked everything up. After all, they only had a limited amount of food and they didn't have room in their homes for uninvited guests. As the travelers made their way into the town square, they found a place to camp near some water, filled up their cooking pot, and put it over a fire. As it was simmering, the townspeople became curious and watched with a side eye. What in the world were these travelers doing? Did they bring food to share? Travelers never bring food to share. Plus, they look so different. They probably don't have the same types of food cleanliness either. The villagers all wondered fearfully about the possible differences. But one villager decided to get a closer look and worked up the courage to ask what they were cooking. The travelers explained that they were making a wonderful dish called stone soup and that they'd be happy to share with the entire village if only there were a few stones that they could spare. So the villager thought about this for a moment and decided that there were plenty of stones lying around and well, he'd never had stone soup before, so what harm would there be in offering a few? Magnificent, the travelers cried as they dropped the stones in and stirred the pot. One of the travelers even thought out loud, hmm, these stones are going to be perfect, but they would be even better if we would have brought some carrots along. So the villager thought about this again and quickly decided that he could part with a few carrots and added them to the pot. As he was doing so, another villager passed on by, asked what they were doing, and, well, she realized that you can't have carrots without having potatoes, so she quickly went and grabbed a few of those. And then another villager remembered that there was some extra beef hanging in a cellar. And another realized that they had had a really bountiful year of cabbage that year, so they soon added that to the pot. When all was said and done, this stone soup was one of the best soups that any of them had ever tasted. The townspeople and travelers alike had a feast unlike any other the town had seen before. And in working together and getting to know each other, it became apparent that their differences did not define them. And that when they work together, all will benefit. I really love this sly old folk tale because it reminds me that one small act can lead to another and then another, and then another, until life isn't the same any longer. It shows that great things can happen through small means, and that when we work together for the greater good, we have the power within ourselves to change the world as we know it. One small but mighty act that this story shows us is how we think about what makes us who we are. The labels, the names, the identifiers that we give to ourselves or acquire from others. What makes someone in or out. How we treat those who look or act differently. Deep down, names and labels are incredibly powerful. This past week even, the New York Times published an article written by Kelly Marie Tran, who is one of the lead actresses in the latest Star Wars movie. She plays Rose Tico, the resistance mechanic, who offered the infamous line, we're going to win this war not by fighting, fighting what we hate, but by saving what we love. 
She is also the first lead female of color to be cast in any of the Star Wars movies. And in this article, she responds to the online harassment that she's received this summer and the racist and misogynist comments that she has had over a lifetime. The full article articulately captures the power of stereotypes and labels and prejudices. And in one part, she writes, their words reinforced a narrative I have heard my whole life, that I was other, that I didn't belong, that I wasn't good enough, simply because I wasn't like them. And that feeling I realize now was and is shame, a shame for the things that made me different, a shame for the culture from which I came from. And to me, the most disappointing thing was that I felt it all. And for a long time, I believed them. She goes on to talk about how those labels and derogatory comments changed her behaviors and kept her from feeling like a person worthy of love and acceptance, but that she wasn't going to allow that to any longer. That she's making this public stance to fight for herself and others because she has a unique privilege as an actress to do so. So that all may be seen as they always have been, as human beings. Maybe you understand a little bit of what she's going through. Maybe you've been on the wrong side of a label at one time or another. It's interesting how deceptively simple yet revolutionary it is when we treat others with dignity and respect. When we become skilled in compassion instead of being driven by differences or the fear of the unknown. When we allow ourselves to not be limited by the things that keep us apart and enter into the discomfort of walking alongside each other. In today's scripture, the Apostle Paul is writing to the early Christians in Galatia. And each community that he writes to have their own unique ways of being and living, their own strengths and challenges, they express faith in their own ways, and the people of Galatia are certainly no different. They're passionate and dedicated, stubborn and hard-headed, smart and foolish, committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but really don't have any idea of what that looks like in real life or how they should form their lives together as this new community. In other words, they're human beings through and through. For instance, the Jewish men of Paul's day in one of their morning prayers would say, blessed are you, O God, ruler of the universe, who has not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. This was known as the three blessings, showing that they believed those labels to be the lowest of the low, so to speak. So Paul reprimands them as the foolish Galatians because they couldn't figure out how to get along. This could have been because of the labeling or it could have been because they couldn't figure out what type of rituals were meaningful for them or how to order their lives together. So he reminds them very bluntly that those names, orders, and rituals are not what define them. What defines them most fully that they need to remember is their baptism into Christ Jesus, in whom they have professed their belief. In Christ, there is no longer Gentile or Jew. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all are now one. This promise is one of the most freeing and challenging words in Scripture because it unites humanity with all of our differences without getting rid of our unique identities, but bringing us together as one, even with the people we dislike. And as the article from the New York Times suggests, we need this constant reminder that all are human beings worthy of love. You see, baptism into Christ's life, death, and resurrection is not a magic trick. It's not a get into heaven free card. Baptism shows us very tangibly when we're surrounded by our family and friends and their community, when we're washed in the waters, that every dividing line is erased. Not just the faith names of Jew or Gentile, but also gender, class, status, race, and so much more. To, the ears, to our ears, this may sound something like something we've heard before, or may start to seem insignificant. But to the early Christians in Galatia, this would have changed their view of the world as they knew it. It redefined them completely, 
according to God's promises and not by the societal standards. And it actually gave them that freedom to enter into those hard and holy relationships. And it's this redefining, this promise, this freedom that continues to shape the world that we live in today. When we believe that we are clothed in Christ and that Christ works through our hands and feet, it changes who we are. We can feel it. We can become empowered by it. We can be defined by it. It not only enables us to answer the most basic of all human questions, who am I, with the ability to say, in Christ I am a child of God. I am united with all the people of God, past, present, and future. In Christ I find my grounding. But it also gives us the chance to begin answering the question, who are we to each other? In Christ we anchor our lives together. In this promise, we begin to recognize that all have deep hurts and pains, but that we're not in this journey alone. We can find that we have the capacity to be more compassionate because there aren't the barriers that keep us apart. We can listen deeply to someone else's reality without having to interject our own. We can accept differences in opinions understand where we need to disconnect or reconnect so that we may walk side by side. And if you're looking for a place to start, if you need to have that concrete idea, begin with one small act of kindness for someone else. To offer the carrot and the stone soup, so to speak. Or to speak up with your own unique privilege for the sake of someone marginalized. If we think deeply about it, there are so many examples of how this works. A smile from a stranger that changes your attitude. A compliment to get an, give an extra boost of esteem. Working together to fix a problem instead of complaining about it. Not tolerating gossip or underhanded comments. Speaking positively. Sharing soup with a neighbor or unintended guest. The options are really endless. And it shows that our lives are deeply interconnected. And we have the promise and the freedom to bless each other's lives by becoming fully who we are created to be. Our community in Christ isn't so much about order or ritual as much as it is about showing up for yourself, for God, for the people around you who need to feel just as you do, that the blessings and burdens of being a human are not theirs to bear alone. In Christ, we are made one, clothed with dignity, com uniqueness, compassion, and wonder, called to love and care for all of God's beautiful and messy creation. Amen.